draw your attention this morning to words found in uh, Peter's first letter, chapter 3, and the last verse of chapter 3, where it says of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So, children, having uh, heard a little bit about Jesus going up to heaven, we are going to continue with this theme now and take it further. You, do you know how many days it is from Easter Sunday to the ascension of Jesus. We had it in the reading, actually. Forty, okay? Forty days. Forty days. So if you count from Easter Sunday this year, including Easter Sunday, if you count 40 days, that's a good little maths uh, for you, you will find that the 40 days is up this coming Thursday. All right? Thursday. That's Ascension Day. We don't bother too much about Ascension Day. We have Good Friday, we have Easter, we have Christmas, we have perhaps Whit Sunday, or even that's gone by the board much these days, about the coming of the Holy Spirit. But Thursday, it's in the middle of the week, isn't it? So uh, we don't think about it. The Ascension of our Lord Jesus, very, very important. Now, Peter is writing this letter to Christians in Asia Minor, as it was called then. It's called Turkey today. And uh, it appears that they were suffering for their faith, suffering a lot of persecution. Some scholars think that this letter was written to new Christians, only recently been converted and baptized, which is perhaps why he mentions about baptism in the previous verses. And uh, water baptism, he is saying here, is introduced to emphasize the judgment that we've passed through if we're believers. Like Noah passed through the judgment of waters. But belonging to Jesus Christ in union with him, death and resurrection, we pass from death to life. We pass from destruction to newness of life in Jesus Christ. And also, cleansing, it, baptism reminds us of the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit and of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And baptism also speaks here, as he says, the pledge of the good conscience toward God. In other words, it is the assurance of God's forgiveness of our sins. It's a bit like what is written in the, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. Our hearts, it says there, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And so the writer urges us to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Well, 
It's not baptism I'm dealing with this morning, but the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice that in this passage, he mentions the death of Jesus, being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then goes on now to speak of his ascension, gone into heaven. So, let's try to understand what the ascension means from what is given to us here in this passage. What a change it would make, really, if we really understood and really appreciated what the ascension of Jesus is about. We can't go into it all, but just a little bit from what we have here. It's an amazing, wonderful fact. We are told, first of all, that Jesus has gone into heaven. Now, that may not seem very significant on first glance. Jesus has gone into heaven. Surely we would expect him to go into heaven. He was a good man. He deserved to go into heaven. Yes. And, of course, if you speak to the general public, if they have any sense of God or Jesus or religion, they will sense, yeah, I hope to go there as well, to heaven. Heaven is where so many people think they are going to. Because, you know, that's what happens to you when you die. You go to heaven. But let's be clear about it. Before Jesus went to heaven, he went to hell. So there's not only a heaven, there is a hell. And Jesus experienced that hell on the cross. That's what the cross was all about. He re received the awful judgment that our sins deserve. That's what he experienced on the cross. I know there is a hell because Jesus suffered it on the cross. There was no point in uh, Jesus going through all that if there's no hell. No point at all. Why did Jesus ever come and suffer such an awful death on the cross if there's no hell? There is a hell to come for all those who do not belong to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and to save sinners like us and to give his life a ransom for many to buy us back to bring us to God because we weren't going that way we were going the opposite way outside of Christ we're going the opposite way which leads to hell my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me said Jesus on the cross forsaken by God hell away from the presence of God outer darkness something like what Jesus experienced in the darkness that uh, surrounded him at that time as he was dying. Out of darkness. Awful. But now we're told Jesus went to heaven. But what does that really mean here? It's not a reference to him having died and gone to heaven is it because we know that when Jesus actually died on the cross yeah his human spirit Jesus the son of God was there in his humanity on the cross in his human spirit he gave up his spirit we are told to the father so he went in his humanity to the father in the spirit in his spirit and his human body 
was placed in a tomb. But then, on the third day, he rose from the dead, just as the scriptures said. And for 40 days, he was seen by many, many people. They saw him, they heard him, they touched him even, they spoke to him, they had meals with him. But he was coming and going. He was there one minute, then he wasn't. But he was still a very much physical, alive person. He wasn't a ghost. They could touch him and handle him. And uh, there he says, see, see the nail prints. See my side where the sword was. It's me, alive. A glorified body. But that glorified presence was not to remain on this earth. Jesus said, I must go away because otherwise the Holy Spirit will not come. And he's going to carry on. And he'll be in the world and he'll be with you right to the end of the age. You see, even with a glorified body, Jesus couldn't be everywhere, could he? He can only be in one place at one time, in a body, in a physical body. Glorified physical body, but only in one place. So Jesus went up to heaven in his glorified body now. That's the big difference, you see. He went to heaven in a glorified body. And where is he now? He is in heaven, in his glorified body. That's very helpful to remember. I've lost my place in my notes, but it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> uh, he is there in his glorified body. And he's there for us today in his glorified body so that we can pray through him and that God the Father hears us through him. He is the great mediator between heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, the one mediator and saviour. He is alive to hear us. So that if we cry to him, however uncertain, however difficult, yet the slightest cry to him, he hears. We can be assured that we are heard in heaven because of Jesus. That's important. It's important to know. What an assurance, if you belong to him this morning, to know that he is there for you this morning. He is there for you. At your lowest point in life, he is there for you. If you know him, come to him. Through, we come to the Father through Jesus and know that we are secure. We know that we are safe. Couldn't be in better hands, could we? Knowing that Jesus is our saviour, our friend, our Lord and our God. In all this pandemic and that. And life has been difficult and it has been hard and not been easy. But Jesus knows. Jesus is there. Jesus is for us. And of course he sent his spirit on the day of Pentecost and his spirit can be everywhere. Jesus' spirit, the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And he's with us 
wherever we are here in this world. That's the wonderful thing about Jesus having gone to heaven. Bodily. You don't go looking for Jesus' body now on earth anywhere. Not find it. It's in heaven. Now, the second thing we notice here is this. We are told that he is at the right hand of God. With angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Now that's a statement, isn't it, eh? Where is he in heaven? At the right hand of God the Father. And everybody in heaven subject to him. Wow. We have just sung the highest place that heaven affords is his. Marvelous. Well, Jesus couldn't be in a better place, the highest place, next to the Father. This is emphasized, you know, many times in the New Testament. It's the first preaching on the day of Pentecost mentions it. Peter mentions it there. And Paul mentions it, Romans chapter 8. These people, you see, were emphasizing the very basics of the faith, and they needed to all the time. And we need to keep on hearing the basics of the faith. What's the basics of the faith? That Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and was seen, and that he ascended to the right hand of the Father with all heaven subject to him. And he is there until all his enemies are under his feet. At the right moment in God's plan, he will return. It was at the right moment in God's plan that Jesus first came into the world. It seemed an awful long time since the creation when God first gave that promise to Adam and Eve about the seed of the woman bruising the serpent's head. Wow. Long, long time back. It was a long, long time back when Abraham heard those words, in you all families of the earth will be blessed. In you and your descendants all families of the earth will be blessed. And uh, Jacob, hearing of this coming descendant from Judah. David being pointed more forward to it. We're talking about thousands of years before. And David speaks about not just the uh, sufferings of the Saviour, but the glory that would follow. And Isaiah does the same thing, and uh, so many of the other prophets speak of it, that this wonderful Saviour would not only come into the world the first time, and of course his birth is prophesied, his, his sufferings are prophesied, his death is prophesied, his resurrection is prophesied, but his ascension is also prophesied. Psalm 110, the most famous Old Testament passage quoted in the New Testament so many times. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is what he's quoting, you see, here. Peter is quoting. And uh, even in Psalm 2, God says to the Son, the Father says to the Son, today I've begotten you. And uh, 
again, it, uh, it says, doesn't it, there in uh, Psalm, in Psalm 2, uh, I'll just refer to it just in case I don't get the exact quotation. <clears throat> I will set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Be wise, O kings, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So there we are. We're encouraged in the Old Testament scriptures to look to Jesus who died for us and rose for us and ascended for us and who sits at the right hand of the Father for us. Trust him. Bow to him. Bow to him now. There'll be a day when all will have to. There's a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But it'll be an awful day for those who don't know him as Saviour. When he comes again, he's coming in power and he's coming in glory. He's coming in to judge the living and the dead. The first time he came, he came to save. He didn't come to judge, he came to save. The second time, he comes with those same clouds that took him into the heavenlies into heaven itself. Those same clouds will bring him again. And every eye will see him. And all will have to acknowledge him. Are you ready to meet him? You remember, the judge is the one who came to be the saviour. The judge is the one who knows us. The judge is the one who has experienced life in this awful world. The judge is the one who has been tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. This judge is the one who knows what injustice is like in this world. And when he comes again, it'll be perfect justice. But now... He is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father with all the angelic hosts, bowing to him. He's in the place of importance. Aren't you thankful this morning that we're not in the hands of chance forces, but we're in the hands of of a God who rules over all. Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing. This pandemic hasn't taken him by surprise. Taken the rest of the world by surprise, but not him. And he is able to care for us and to look after us. Whatever comes. Whether life or death. We all have to pass from this world sooner or later but the Lord knows when our time is so we are safe and we are secure in the arms of Jesus Christ I trust you are safe in the arms of Jesus Christ this morning the arms of a Lord who loves and who has given himself for such people that we might not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, may God help us all this morning to know this for ourselves. Oh, may God help us all to trust this God, even when we feel low, when we feel down, when we feel dissatisfied with life, when the going is hard, or when, we, when Satan tempts us to despair and tells us of the wrongs within. Oh, may God help us to look up and see him there, seated at the Father's right hand, ever living to intercede for us. 
This is the Jesus who knows us, feels for us, aware of all our needs and problems and difficulties, but urges us to come to him and to rest in him and trust in him and to look forward to the day when we will see him as he is and be like him. Yes, even having resurrected bodies one day like him, glorified bodies like him. Wonderful, wonderful good news. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great hope of the world. And Lord, we pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us all. Amen. Amen.